Okay, guys, we're going to be looking at something new this, this evening, and uh, it's uh, one of the most important things, how to die young at a very old age. So I'm Dr. Steve Hansen, and uh, so we're going to show you what we can. Okay. So that's Auntie Alice. It's a terrible picture. I got it off the internet. Auntie Alice died at 101 years old. She lived on the south coast of Natal and she had a very healthy life. At 101, she'd lived from 1900 to 2001, three centuries. And in general, she was healthy at 80 something. She climbed up over 100 st stairs in Israel. My parents, my father died at 98, my mother at 97. So I learned something from those three. And I've learned that we need to change certain things. And they can just be small things for us to have a completely different outcome. In South Africa, Life expectancy is only 55 years. In America, it's about 76 years old. And uh, we can make a difference by the behavior. And the behaviors are a problem because we have lack of physical exercise. We have smoking, alcohol abuse, drug use. People miss work because of the abuse of their bodies, physical and emotional stress, se severe obesity, diabetes, depression, suicide attempts, heart disease, cancer, strokes, COPD, broken bones. There are just so many things that happen in people's lives. But we can change a lot of these things. Many times we're told that it's actually genetic, but genetic issues are less than 10%. The rest is lifestyle. We can use epigenetics to change so much. Epigenetics is when we affect the genes by our lifestyle and behavior. So that can change so much in our lives. So we can have an outcome where we live healthily until a very old age. And as we said in the, in the advert, people fear disease and they fear growing old because they think that they'll be sick and in a wheelchair and not well. But it doesn't have to be like that. If we make certain changes, then we can live much, much longer. The brain. Do you know that 450 million people worldwide are affected by the brain issues, such as Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia? And it is the leading cause of disability worldwide. Not only is it disabling, but it is a death sentence for many. And in fact, if we have a mental condition such as Alzheimer's and we lose our mental capacities, we are actually the living dead. People who have Alzheimer's are the living dead because they don't recognize the families. They don't know where they are. I heard the story of one person who, a lady, she was in her 80s, and she wouldn't allow her husband into the marital bed because she didn't recognize him anymore. And she thought he was an absolute stranger, so she wouldn't allow him in. But after doing certain treatments, she changed. She became uh, rehabilitated into society. And... Uh, and was completely changed back and she was almost back to her old self. 
And in fact, a few years ago, we had a lady who scored very low on an Alzheimer's test that we do. She couldn't remember anything. She couldn't uh, integrate into society. In the end, that lady was involved in her church and, uh, and doing all kinds of things for charity, et cetera. So such good stories, such really, really positive things. Now, mental health has been affecting more people than ever. It's a pandemic. It's a real pandemic worldwide. As I said, 450 million people 450 are affected by some form of de dementia. But there is hope. Now, tonight is just an introduction, and we're going to be talking about consciousness and uh, mental health and what we can change. I think we got someone who's not muted there, Tandy Michelle. But, um, so we're getting a bit of noise coming through. So we're going to start unlocking the keys to neurodegenerative disorders. One in four people have some form of degenerative disorder, mental disorder. There is hope. And of course, there's that old joke that says, of all the things that I have lost, the one that I miss the most is my mind. Now we've spoken about the blue zones, and those are in Okinawa in Japan, Sardinia in Italy, which is an island, Nicosia, yeah, uh, Costa Rica, uh, Icaria in Greece, uh, Loma Lima in California, and areas in southern Italy. Now, in those areas, people live to very, very old ages, 100 years or more. They've got more centenarians than other places in the world. So we need to duplicate their lifestyle if we can, as far as possible. And then we can live healthily into old age. Now, there are nine secrets, the power of nine to what these people do. They move naturally. Now, they move naturally throughout the day. They, they walk, they garden, they do housework. And that is a core part of those blue zone areas of their lifestyle. And it's simple that we have to keep moving, keep circulation going, keep our brains full of oxygen, keeping healthy. And the second thing, of the nine is purpose. And what happens is we need a purpose in life. And it makes us healthier, it makes us happier. And it adds up to seven extra years to your life, just having a purpose. I'll take my father in the in, in his case, lived to 97. He had a purpose. He had ideas that he would do great things, even at 96. He really believed that he was going to go out and do wonderful things and change the world. So he died and he had a very, very short illness, very short, just a few short weeks or months even. And then the third point is shifting down. Now we know that stress is part of life, but those centenarians in the blue zones have stress relieving rituals built into their daily routines. The Adventists pray in, uh, uh, in, in California. Um, the, the Sardinians have um, a happy hour uh, uh, where they'll go and lie back and relax during the day. So things are good in those areas for, for relaxing. And we need to get those rituals into our lives as well. Then the next thing they have, number four, is the 80% rule. People in blue zones stop eating when their stomachs are 80% full. And they eat their, their smallest meal in the early evening. Now that is so important because you can't sleep well if you don't die, if you have, Food to digest and we need to sleep 
without having our, our bodies working at digestion, because what will happen is we won't be able to detoxify, we won't be able to heal if our, our bodies are working very hard at digestion, etc. And number five, they have a plant slant. So beans are a cornerstone of most centenarian diets, vegetables, fruit, and whole grains. The rest of the diet is if meat is eaten, and a lot don't eat meat, it's only in small amounts. It's only in amounts that, uh, that are taken maybe once or twice a week. And one of the, the, uh, the diets is a pescatarian diet in Southern Italy. They really, really only eat fish and they eat vegetables and that's it. And many of them are fully vegetarian or vegan. And another thing which we spoke about before in one of the other talks is moderate but regular consumption of wine with friends or food. And it's part of the blue, blue zone lifestyle. Now, when, when I say consumption regularly, it's one glass or two glasses maximum. And it's in a social setting, not drinking alone, but in a social setting. And another uh, number seven is that being part of a faith-based community adds 14 years to life expectancy. Imagine just believing in some sort of faith would add 14 years to your life. Isn't that amazing? The, the, the Seventh-day Adventists pray and they go to church. The guys in Okinawa in Japan, they try to connect with their ancestors. So it's a faith-based lifestyle. And then number eight is loved ones. A belonging, but loved ones. So having a close and strong family connection with spouses, parents, grandparents, grandchildren is very common in the blue zones. And in fact, in, in Okinawa, their friends last a lifetime. They have appointed five, they, they are appointed five friends that will stay supporting each other for the whole of their lives. And in general, they'll live in the same area for the whole of their lives with their friends, with their families. And the right tribe is the next one, number nine. The world's longest living people have close friends and strong social networks. So belonging to something, belonging to some sort of religious order, and that it's up to you what you, what you want to uh, believe, but belonging to some organization, belonging to people, people belonging to you, socializing, make all the difference. But we have a problem in the world today. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about the ACE or ACE studies, adverse childhood events. Studies have been show, have shown that uh, we need to get rid of our imprinted emotions, the programs that run subconsciously in our minds, and the 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 um, the whole thing is studies were done where they looked at different events in, at childhood, such as physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, neglect, physically and emotionally. And when they looked at these, at these uh, events, they found that the people who had those events would grow up and have issues physically and emotionally into adulthood. For example, if you take fibromyalgia, mostly in women, and 60% of people who have fibromyalgia have been sexually abused when they're small, 60%. Um, there's uh, household dysfunction, where you have people in, your, in the home when, when, when you're small who have um, uh, 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 
mental illnesses, if a uh, relative, close relative was incarcer uh, in, uh, incarcerated, a relative, it makes a huge difference. Those are all different events. Uh, mother treated violently, especially in front of the children, substance abuse, divorce, divorce. And if, if we have any of those things, and over three, that means that we have serious issues coming if we don't sort these things out and get rid of those programs, which run subconsciously. We don't even realize they, they're affecting us in many cases, but they are. When you drive your car, you don't change gear and um, uh, think about changing gear, putting your foot on the brake, putting your foot on the accelerator. No. What happens is you do these things in your subconscious mind. And in fact, we are 95% in our subconscious minds, only 5% in our conscious minds. So it means we don't even realize or know the thoughts that we're thinking. As we think these thoughts, so they have an effect physically, emotionally on us. And we can react to certain things, road rage, different abuse like that. So what is amazing is that people don't realize they've got this anger built up inside of them. And if that anger is not removed or released, they could have road rage and get themselves shot because of the anger and they don't even realize where it's coming from but in many cases it comes from events during childhood so we need to work on these things and as we progress in in what we're going to be talking about because this is a series this is not just one uh one evening this is a series of uh talks and we're going to cover many of these things so that we can live healthily into old age and i think everybody tonight would like to live healthily into old age no one would like to have dementia where dementia you don't even know you've got it but you make life hell on earth for your friends your families when you don't recognize them don't know who they are when you have no memory of who they are imagine if you're one of your parents Got, had Alzheimer's or other, other forms of dementia, and they couldn't remember who you were. How bad is that? And they shouted and screamed at you because of the, these mental conditions. So what we have to do is we have to take action now because dementia and, uh, and, and, uh, and other forms of, uh, of, of mental conditions or mental illnesses start when we're young. They don't start when we're 60 or 70 or 80. No, they start young. We can see the signs early, 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 even 40s and 50s these days, people are being affected. So we need to take action now so it doesn't happen to us and doesn't happen to our families. Now, another thing that affects people is a shock conflict. Now, shock conflicts were discovered many years ago. And what a shock conflict is, it's when something unexpected happens, it's dramatic, it's isolating, and we have no plan to deal with it. So I'll give you an example of a shock conflict. A shock conflict could go something like this. A lady believes she's happily married and she's living in bliss with her husband. One day, she arrives home and she sees that there's a chain around her front door and there's a sign from the sheriff and it says, I have locked your house up because the bond hasn't been paid for a long period of time and there's about a million rand outstanding. And then she sees another, another little note on the wall and that note reads something like this my dear Susie I love you so much however I haven't been able to pay the bond I haven't told you because I didn't want to worry you and I haven't paid your car so unfortunately they're going to repo that tomorrow 
And I've got some more news for you. I fell in love with your best friend and we're moving to Australia. Your loving husband, John. As you see, it's unexpected. Mm -hmm. It's dramatic. It's isolating. She can't talk to her husband, who she thought was her best friend or her best friend, and she has no plan to deal with it. Immediately what happens is the heart and the brain communicate and the heart tells the brain to fix this problem. And then the brain sends information down to the body and that information will be generate extra cells uh, or it might be uh, uh, generate cells in the, in the joints or the extra cells might be, if it's, if it's a, a, a loved one, it could be in one of the organs such as the, the breasts or the uterus and cancer will grow. It's actually an attempt of the body to heal itself. But because of the shock, it continues healing. And until that is healed or cleared up or the internal program is fixed, you, you, you won't be able to fix that cancer permanently. If it's cancer or if it's arthritis, you won't be able to fix it. it each organ is, uh, is uh, related to certain, to certain conflicts or shock conflicts. Now, this all came about in, uh, in a, in, uh, many years ago in Italy. This was discovered by uh, a, a, an oncologist. And he, he, what happened was his son was shot by a count's son. And his son died. Within six months, he got prostate cancer and his wife got breast cancer. And he said, there must be some link. I was completely healthy before this. My wife was healthy. And now we had this issue. And he did a lot of work. And uh, his name was Reich Harmer. And he, he did 40,000 case studies finding that cancer is triggered by shocks and conflicts. Now, I'll give you an example of something that's not necessarily a shock conflict. A lady's at university and she's studying. And at university, there's a promiscuous society. So she moves in with her boyfriend. And they, they're living together in, in uh, res. And then one day, her boyfriend decides, ah, I'm going off with her friend. And he moves in with her friend. That might not be a shock conflict because it's not shocking. It's not unexpected. It's not isolating. And he has a plan because at university, that is the lifestyle. Whereas the first lady, it was completely unexpected. So those are shock conflicts. Now, those have to be cleared before we can live a long and healthy life, because before we can live disease-free, before we can change the way our outcomes will be. So as we change things in our lives so we can be healthy and die very young at a very old age, Now, this little chart here will show us, shows us that uh, we, when we're born, we, we uh, go up to good health quite quickly, most times. In general, we will, by the, by the age of 20 or around 20, our, our health will be good. We'll be at school. We'll do sport at school. We'll eat reasonably healthy because your mother often will look after you and send you to school with healthy lunch boxes, hopefully. Certainly was like that. But when people leave school, often that goes out the window. They will, and if you look just before 40, around that time, the health, the health starts to fail. And as the health goes down quickly, so they become uh, uh, overweight, no more exercise, they start drinking too much, they start eating too much, and um, they live an unhealthy lifestyle. So, uh, 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 sitting too much, uh, not walking enough, 
and then they go down further because now they're overweight and they're starting to get diabetes and they're getting really, really sick. And we see at around the age of 50, many people act as if they are much, much older. So they live as vertically ill. So they can still walk around in many cases, but some are in wheelchairs. Some have to have their legs amputated or different limbs amputated, but they live on unhealthy, miserable, feeling very, very sick, uh, dementia in many cases, but they're alive, but they're the living dead. And then they die a slow, horrible death because of their lifestyle. Lifestyle accounts for most of our issues today. A hundred years ago, cancer was virtually unheard of. A hundred years ago, sugar diabetes was virtually unheard of. But the good thing is that it can be reversed. In many cases, unless we leave it too late, it can be reversed. And the time is now for change. The time is now for us to take action so that we don't end up having dread diseases, losing our minds, being a burden on our families and our children so that we can live to an old age. So the life that we should have is not this one, it's this one, a dynamic lifestyle. So we're born the same. We, we uh, become healthy by the time we're 20. Our hormones are, re are, are good. Our fitness is good. We are um, hopefully eating a healthy life, a uh, healthy uh, um, a diet, and we, and we go along without getting too sick for our whole life. And we live along until we 90, 100. The lady who was the oldest in Italy a few years ago, I'm afraid, she's passed on now, she was 117 years old. She could still hold a conversation with people. Her mind was sharp. Her body was good. She could walk around. She could still work in her garden at 117 years old. And then what happens is, unless there's something untoward, what will happen is you'll just wake up dead one morning. So you go to sleep that night. The next morning you wake up dead and you're in a different place and you ready for your next adventure, whatever that might be. So that is something to really look forward to, living a healthy life with family, friends, enjoying life until the last day, and then we move on to the next phase of our existence. Exciting, I think, instead of having to live for years on numerous different uh, substances which supposedly help us but actually don't help us at all they make us worse now all you have is now you don't have the past you don't have the future you only have the now and all we have right now is this very moment all of us on this call we have no future, no past. We only have the now. The past is gone. The future is not here yet. We only have the now. But we ruin the now by dwelling in both the past and the future. Now, if you look at that on this chart, we see below the line, are all the things that happened, the negative things that happened when we were small. For example, somebody shouted at us. Somebody did something that really hurt us. Uh, we might have been abused. We might have had a terrible upbringing. And those things are in the past, but so many times we hold on to them even through our subconscious mind and we have them now with us. But the event doesn't exist at all. The event is gone. Never, ever to be seen again. However, the event is with us 
in our subconscious mind and sometimes in our conscious mind. It's there as a program. And that program is running subconsciously in our minds. And as it runs in our minds, so we will react to certain circumstances. In other words, we have triggers. So as we have these triggers in our, in our subconscious mind, somebody will say something to us, could say something to us. We don't even realize it and we fly off the handle. But it's a minor thing they've said. However, it is a trigger back to something that happened in our past. And we need to work at clearing those past subconscious triggers, the subconscious programs that are running under the radar. We're driving along the road. Somebody just cuts in front of us just a, ever so slightly, and we get so angry. Why do we get so angry? Because of events in the past. It might be when we were small that somebody did something bad to us. It might be that we worked in the security forces or in some sort of form where we saw a lot of violence and a lot of bad stuff happening or we might have even been involved in it ourselves. And that creates a subconscious um, a program, but the events don't exist anymore. They're gone, they're not there. It's like this. If you go to Durban, now Durban is a beautiful city, and you go to the beach, and you see on the sea sand, they have these sculptors who make sand sculptors. They could be a sand sculptor of sculpture of a dolphin or a shark or a castle or a person lying there in their swimming costume lying there. Now, that's made by a sculptor. And that sculptor is the same as someone who causes an event in your life. And that sand sculptor will remain there until a few things happen. Maybe someone kicks it down. Maybe it rains. Maybe the wind blows it away. Maybe the sea, the tide comes in and washes it away. The sculptor goes home and that sculpture remains there. But when the sculpture comes back, sculptor comes back the next morning or whenever he comes back, he doesn't um, have anything to do with that old one, he builds a new one. And that's exactly what emotional events are like. That person won't cause that problem again. He might make new problems, but he won't cause that one again. So the event doesn't exist at all, only in your conscious or subconscious mind. So it's the energy within you that is the problem, not the event. Then we have another one where people live their lives when they're small and they look back and they say, when I was young, the trees were greener, the sky was bluer. I had a much happier life. When I was small, or when I was young, I had such a wonderful life. If only I could have that life again. Well, the news is that you can't have that life again. That life is gone. It doesn't exist anymore. Everything that you had then is gone. You've got memories and you've got information on how to do things, how to not to do things. But the events are gone. So we can't look back and wish for the past because the past doesn't exist. We can only live in the now. And the now is right now. That's the only thing is now that we are conscious. So it's very, very negative for us to say, oh, if only I could go back to the past. No, you can't. You've got to live in the now. The only place that you can live and be happy is in the now. You can't be happy in the past. You can't be happy in the future. There's an old saying, and it goes like this. The pursuit of happiness is the greatest reason for unhappiness. 
So if we are hunting for happiness, it makes us unhappy because it's untainable from outside, from past things, from future things. It's untainable. You can't get it from that. So we have to put the past behind us and we have to focus on the now. Yes, we can make plans for the future and that will change the future because of what we do now. But living in the future is not possible or living in the past is not possible. Now, here's another one. This is the future and people are so worried. They live a life of absolute terror and worry. I'm so scared I'll be robbed. I'm so scared that something bad will happen. I'll lose my money. The government will steal my money. I'll have no electricity and I might starve to death because I might lose my job. I won't be able to survive. I won't be able to do this and I won't be able to do that. No, that doesn't exist. If the future existed, it would be the now. So it can't exist. It's not possible. So we can't live in the future in fear. So we've got to realize that living in fear is a very, very bad place to live. Now, I stole this slide from Yvonne. I saw it on Biosol's website. Oh, no, the, the WhatsApp group. I think it was yesterday or the day before. And I had thought about this. I was going to make a slide, but I found this one. So that was good. So I didn't have to. So things I worry about are lots. So many times we worry about things, but most of those things can't happen, most. But a very small proportion can happen. But statistically, 94% of things we worry about don't ever, ever happen. So we're sitting around worrying, making ourselves ill with worry over things that will never happen. How many times have you worried about things that never came true? How many times? Instead of changing it. But what I must say is this. If we worry about things and fear things, then they are more likely to happen. If we look in the Bible and we think about Job, remember Job is a guy that had a lot of stuff and families and different things, and he lost it all. And what did he say? He said, the thing I feared most came upon me. The thing I feared most. So the more we worry the more it could come upon us. The more we dwell on negative things, the more it's likely to come upon us. Now, if you look down the bottom of that slide, in a little dot, those are the things that do happen. Such, such a small amount of things can happen. And such a small th amount of things, even less, never happen. So 94% of things we, don't, we worry about never happen. So thank you for that, Yvonne. And the last one of these slides, I will be happy when. So many people say this, I'll be happy when I've got a bigger car. I'll be happy when I've got a bigger house. I'll be happy when I've got a new husband or wife, or I'll get rid of my current husband or wife. I'll be happy when this happens or when that happens. The truth of the matter is we can plan to change things in the future, but you can't be happy in the future because they don't exist. What we have to do is work in the now, plan, take action now, and we can change the future. Then the future can be happy, but you don't have to look for happiness because happiness is not out there to get. It's only within you. Now we're gonna look at consciousness. This is very important. This is, a, this is a chart of, of human consciousness. And uh, uh, I got this idea from David Hawkins, who made a chart of consciousness, but I've changed it quite a lot. So thank you, David Hawkins, for the ideas. But um, it's changed a lot. So we this chart here starts at the top. And you see there's an infinity sign there. Now that is the God number or the God's God place. So that's where we have all knowledge, we have all love, we have truth and pure love. That is the place that we should all be working towards. 
Now, 500 on this chart is neutral, and one is the lowest point you can have. And one is where the murderers and the rapists and the really bad guys are. And those people there are there for a reason. People don't just pop out of mom when they're born and say, I think I'll become a murderer in this life. Or I think I'll become a rapist in this life. Or I think I'll be a robber. No, that doesn't happen. It doesn't happen at all. It's what happens during our nurturing that teaches us these things. In other words, a child could pop out and be at 500, which is neutral. And then what, while they're growing up, they have abuse, they have uh, parents who are robbers and thieves and whatever it is, and that trains the child in the way they'll go. Or they could have brilliant parents and they can move up above 500 or they can move down. But it depends on the person and it depends on how they lead their lifestyle. That person could lead, lead his or her lifestyle in one way. Someone from the same family could lead their life in a completely different way. I heard an illustration, a story of this, and it goes like this. There was a tramp or a drunk, and he lived on the streets. And with him were his two sons. And they lived on the, on the streets, and he was drinking, and uh, they lived, and the children grew up, both boys grew up. And when the boys grew up, they both went their ways. And the first boy became a lawyer, a human rights lawyer. And he defended human rights cases, huge cases. And he won these cases. And he was doing so much good in the world that it was amazing. And it, it became well known around that he was one of the really good guys one of the small percentage of really good lawyers. And, uh, uh, um, and then his brother, he became an alcoholic on the streets and he lived on the streets. A reporter got hold of this and he went to the first son who was the human rights lawyer and he said, tell me, you are a human rights lawyer. Why did you do this. You grew up on the streets. Your father was an alcoholic. How come? What happened? What changed? And he said, with a father like mine, how could I be any different? Then the reporter went to the second boy and he said, tell me the story about you. You are on the streets. You're an alcoholic. How come? What happened? And he said, with a father like mine, how could I be any different? Now, we see you've got 625. If we have a person who's at 600 on this chart, that person is making life better for people, for himself or herself, because he's above 500. As you go up the, the, the scale, so you're more enlightened. So you are uh, more loving, et cetera, et cetera, as you go up the scale. But down at 25, you have another person. So let's assume that one person is at 600 and another person is at 25. It goes like this. If you dive into a swimming pool, as you dive into the swimming pool and the, the water is fairly clean, you open your eyes under the water. And when you open your eyes under the water, you look down, you can see if there is a stone on the ground. You can see if there are uh, uh, um, uh, any, any different things on, 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 on the bottom of the pool. There could be sand there. There could be all kinds of things there. You can see that clearly. But if you look up, you can't see the sky. You just see water above you. If you look next to you, you see water next to you. And if you look down, you can see clearly. 
Now, a person is, is as if they're much higher in the water. In fact, they're above the water, almost above the water. A 25 is exactly the same as someone who's underwater. They're in the murky depths and they can't ever have a, have a decent relationship with a 600. 25 can never have that. So you might have experienced this. You try to explain somebody, something to somebody. You explain it so carefully and so well. You explain to them that it's like this and it's like this and it's like this. And they look at you blankly and they walk off. That's because their level of consciousness is completely different. 25 can't have a first order conversation with a 600. So a 600 has to realize that a 25 or lower or any, any lower point is not going to be on the same level as consciousness of, of consciousness as them. So that person must, the 600 must realize you've got to understand where the other person is coming from. They're acting in a certain way because of their program, because of their abilities, because of a number of different things. They will be completely different to you. So it's not just getting angry with a person who has a program. The person who has a program believes that they're right. But actually, that's their program. And they can't see what you can see. So we should say in, in actually feel sorry for them in a way. They might act in certain ways. They might have anger in them. They might um, abuse others. But they can't help themselves because there's no one that's even shown them that there is a problem. Or because they're so low on that scale, they can't even see that there is a problem. They don't even realize it. Or it might even just be in the subconscious mind. Now imagine you go to school. And if you're a girl, you, get, you went to school. And you used to go out and party and get drunk and do all kinds of things. And then you leave school, you stop doing those things, and you move up on the consciousness ladder, and you get to, say, 600. But your friends who were at school, they stay where they were. They don't move up, because most people don't even move up more than five points on the scale in their whole lifetime. So those girls that are still at school, they carry on partying and doing all those things that, um, that are, are damaging their health and uh, all kinds of stuff. Now, one day you meet up with them at the school reunion, 40 years later. 40 years later, 30 years later, you meet up with them at the school reunion and, and you have a conversation with them. And they're having the same conversation they had when you were at school. But you're not interested in that anymore because you've moved far forward. You are now interested in helping people, rebuilding the country, doing those things, but they are still stuck at that point. Now, they're not going to understand what you're talking about. It's going to be completely alien to them because it's not in their consciousness. Until they move up the ladder of consciousness, they won't understand a thing you're talking about. So we have to. Deal with people in such a way that they, on their level, we have to deal on their level of consciousness and realize that that person is there and as they get older, they, they will never, ever change. Now, the sad part is that most people are down the bottom. Most people in the world, they're, they're close to 8 billion, they say. Who knows what the real truth is, people in the world. Now, if we put them all on this uh, ladder of consciousness, we'll see that most of them are down near the bottom, and they are down there just living their lives. If you walk down the street or you stand at a shopping center and you ask 100 people, what is the meaning of life? How many will say knowledge, helping people, uh, doing things that are good for the for the world, trying to fix the planet, trying to fix the country. How many will say that? Most won't. Most of them are down the bottom and they will just say, well, I get up in the morning, I go to work, I work all day, and I come home at night 
drink a whole lot of beer, say nasty things to my wife, go to sleep, get up the next morning and go back to work and there's my cycle. And that's my life. I watch TV. I watch mainstream media. I watch the news. I watch violent programs. I watch the soap operas. There was a um, psychologist in Australia who said, I'll not uh, um, counsel people who, have, who watch soap operas because they take the problems from the soap operas and bring them into their own lives. And I can't deal with that because that, their program is those soap operas. So we've got to realize that most people in this world are living down near the bottom and they've been programmed by whatever and by whomever. And that's why we see people living a life that's senseless and that's dead to the good things in life. They're just living for the sake of living. Some people say, what am I living for? I might as well be dead. No, there's lots to live for. There's lots of things that we have to achieve and accomplish in this life. But there's a ladder. And if you notice at the bottom of the ladder, it's very narrow. And the steps are very slippery and it's hard to get out get onto them. But some people realize they must get onto them and they start to climb up the steps. But this is, there are snakes. So as they climb up the steps, so some, it might be friends, say, no, but come out, let's go and get smashed and drunk. Or let's do these things that, we, that we've always done. And then they slide down the snake. But if they realize and see what's happening, they can go up the ladder. And the higher they go, the better things are. The more they see, it's like standing on a mountain and they look down and they can see what's below. But the higher up you go on this ladder of consciousness, the less people are there. The less people means life is more lonely because you can only really have first order conversations with people who are on the same level as you. So it is more lonely up there, but wow, what an experience. What a great thing. Now, we saw the top was infinity, which is a God number, truth and pure love. And we, in this model, are that. We are, our spirits are infinity, truth and pure love. However, if you look at all those rings around the outside, you'll see that those are things that have programmed us in a certain way in our lives. As we've been programmed, so it's covered who we are. So if you imagine that everybody in the world is at infinity, truth, and pure love, everybody's there, but they've just been coated with these things that have programmed us. So our programs hide who we are, but we've always had it all the time. From when we were born, we've had truth, pure love, and we've been that and infinity, but we've been coated by the things we've been through in, in this world. But as we remove these things, so our love can shine through. So our love can radiate from us so by removing these programs and over this the um the the weeks that, or the months that we're going we're gonna to work on this we're going to work on these things so we can start to remove these things so we can have the benefit of removing the programs so we can move up the ladder of consciousness so that we can get our mental state right so we can live to an old age happily healthily without all these dread diseases. So we can have a situation where we, we uh, have a purpose in life. Yes, we need a purpose in life. We need friends. We need to do this. Now, we've all heard this. And some of you might know this, but we've all heard, let's, 
So that person's got a high frequency or let's raise our frequency. Well, what is that? If you look at these charts here, this is how you can tell the frequency. A person who's at a low frequency, in other words, right at the bottom of that chart that we showed just now, has a very low frequency. And if you look at the, the top sine wave, that is a sine wave, which is a, a, what electricity uses. So it starts at uh, the line, and the line is the infinity line. And it touches the line when it leaves. It goes round up and it comes down, touches the line again, goes down, comes up and touches the line again. So over a period of time, in other words, that is one um, uh, um, uh, wave. Um, it's only touching the line of infinity three times. Three times. And then we look at the, at the chart below, we, we've got the much higher frequency, and we see that it keeps touching the line in the center, which is the infinity, the true love, uh, and, and the truth line many, many times. So you can see that you can't connect with somebody with a lower frequency because they're only touching who they are, their, their higher self, their spirit, three times, but down below, the person who's got a higher frequency is touching many, many times. So they can't even connect because they only touch, the one top one only touches three times, but the one below touches many, many times. So how can they connect? They can only connect possibly three times and it's got to be at the same, the same uh, uh, position in the frequency. Then as we raise our frequency, once we get, and it won't be in this lifetime, once we get through to uh, our new bodies, whatever, uh, however that is, because that's very not very clear, you see that you just have a solid bar. So you're living totally in infinity. You're living totally in the God place. And that's what we've got to strive to attain. That's how we can get our minds right. We can get our bodies right for a much more healthy mind and a much more healthy body, spiritually and physically and emotionally. Now the question is, what do we think of ourselves? Who do you think you are? That's the question. And the simple fact of the matter is that who you are is important, but I'm gonna ask you this question, and I want you to answer this to yourself. And this is the scale that we're going to talk about it. 10 out of 10, I'm the most fantastic person who walked the face of the planet. I can't be better. I can't be worse. I just am 10 out of 10. 0 out of 10, I don't like myself much. And minus 10, I loathe myself. Now, I know this is a complicated pro, uh, 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 problem because some people will say, in this area, I'm good, in that area, I'm bad. But in general, as an average, where would you rate yourself? And silently rate yourself. And you'll be surprised when I ask people this question, how many people rate themselves at minus 10, 0, minus 5? And one thing you'll know is that most people who've been abused and haven't really, really, really come to grips with it are very, very low on self-esteem. And they'll rate themselves way, way, way down. So the sun illustration goes like this. There you are, standing on the earth, looking at the sun. And you see the sun. And where would you rate the sun? 10 out of 10, the most fantastic, the best sun it could be. Couldn't do better. And 0 out of 10, the worst sun. Terrible sun, useless sun, must improve. 
Now, I can't let you answer that because you can't speak to me because you're on mute. However, I'm going to put forward that the sun is a 10 out of 10. The sun gets up in the morning, wakes up, it yawns a bit probably, and it shines all day. And as it shines, it gives you heat and it keeps the um, solar system sustained. It's got its gravitational field that it pulls the Earth and holds it in, in the right orbit. If we moved just a little bit out further away, we would die because it would be too cold. If we got too close, it would fry us. So we're in the exact right position. And the sun, I put to you, is a 10 out of 10. So now the next question is, now, hold on a sec, this thing is not moving anymore. Let me see if I can get it to move. There we are, it's moving again. Okay, I don't know what happened. Uh, yes, it's Microsoft that did that to us or somebody like that. Anyway, what if there are clouds in between you and the sun and you can't actually see the sun? Where will you rate the sun? Will you rate it less or the same? Now, a lot of people will tell us that they rate it at less. However, I say that it's the same because the sun doesn't care about the clouds. The clouds are outside of the sun. So as the clouds are outside of the sun, so with the clouds outside of the sun, what happens is you can't see the sun, say in Joburg, but in Cape Town they might see the sun or in Rio de Janeiro or in London or wherever. So the sun is just going up there, shining, doing its stuff, perfectly and you can't improve the sun at all but because we can't see it the clouds are outside of the sun the sun doesn't care about the clouds they've got no bearing on what the sun does the clouds are there to give us rain to protect us or whatever the case might be to cool us down but the clouds are outside of the sun now if the sun is 10 out of 10 what if you were 10 out of 10? No matter what you thought of yourself, what if you were 10 out of 10? Your spirit. In other words, you were the infinity. You were that person who was perfect as a spirit. But you say to me, oh, no, I don't look good enough or something like that. So if the first cloud is your looks, it's outside of you. As it's outside of you, what happens is it's got nothing to do with who you are. So if a person is 16 or 18 and they're a girl, every boy in town is chasing them. If it's a guy, every girl is keen. But when the person gets to 70, 80, 90, at 95, you're not looking as hot as you did at 16 or 20. Hormones are down a bit, but you're not looking as good unless you go and have yourself done up in a, in a beauty salon, and then you'll look even worse. But anyway, that's another, another story. You're not looking as good as when you were 20. So what that tells us is that if your looks had anything to do with who you were and you're 10 out of 10, what that would mean is that at 70, 80, 90, whatever it is, at a certain point, you'd have to say, oh, no, that person's no good anymore. That person's now a 4 out of 10, no longer a 10 out of 10. And that obviously and clearly is a lot of rubbish. It's absolute nonsense because the person's now got wisdom, da 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 So you're looking at outside stuff, not at who the person is. So we have to look at the spirit of the person, not at the looks. So one person might look different to another, but they're beautiful in their own way. Each person has their own beauty. 
each person. And then the next cloud, what about your skill set? Some people are airline pilots. Now, I don't know how many of you can fly a Boeing 747. Maybe someone can, maybe not. But if you can fly a, a, an airline, a, a pilot, a, if you are a pilot, you can fly an aircraft. At the moment, it's not really the best thing for at all. I know a pilot who's been out of work for three years. This person used to work for a big company that uh, uh, has de de downsized completely and has had no work for, for a number of years. So, yes, it's a skill, but it doesn't affect our 10 out of 10 because someone else has another skill. You might be excellent at um, uh, praying for people or you might be excellent at, um, at being kind to people, taking people uh, food or meals or doing good things. You might be good at that or growing food. So it doesn't matter what you do, but it doesn't affect your 10 out of 10. Your 10 out of 10 is you. That's who you are. And then your emotions. The next cloud could be your emotions. One day you're up, next day you're down. So you could say, today I'm a 10 out of 10 because I'm feeling really good about myself. And then tomorrow, oh no, I got up on the bad side, the, the wrong side of the bed. Now I'm angry. So therefore I'm a five out of 10 or a three out of 10. No, 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 no. You've always had the 10 out of 10. Your emotions are outside of you. They are in your, uh, uh, in, in your, in your, um, in your physical body, in your mind. Um, so that's completely separate from who you actually are. And you've always had this, you know. You've had it. And even though you haven't known you've had it, you've always had it. Just say you were wearing a pair of jeans and you put a 10 rand note in the jeans and it was worth 10 rand and you put your jeans in your cupboard, you hung them up, you forgot the note in your pocket. And then five years later, you go and you op open your cupboard, you take your jeans, that's, oh, I haven't worn these for a long time. You put your jeans on, you put your hand in your pocket and you pull out your 10 rand note. You always had the 10 rand note, it was always yours. You just didn't know you had it or you'd forgotten you had it. It's the same with your 10 out of 10. And it's not arrogant. People think it's arrogant to say I'm 10 out of 10. It's not arrogant. Well, what is arrogance? Arrogance is actually low self-esteem. If you have low self-esteem, you have to be arrogant. So a person who's got low self-esteem will often go out and buy themselves the biggest car or biggest house. And then they will feel good about themselves for a period of time because they're getting their self-esteem from outside. Whereas the only place you can get your self-esteem is from inside, inside you. Because if you realize and you get what I'm telling you now, it will change everything. If you haven't already got it, it will change everything because you will realize that you are complete. The sun is complete. It's like a glass of water. If that water is full to the top, you can't add to it. It is completely full. You pour water on it, the water will just run over because the water is already, it's already complete. So if you're complete, so you could say, I am complete. And if you're complete, no one can ever, ever sell you anything. I'll give you an example. I had a guy come to me a while back. And he had some money. And I explained this to him. And he said, you know, you're right. He said, I have this very fancy Range Rover. It's worth a million rand or whatever it was worth, a lot of money. I parked outside. I said, yeah. He said, you know, when I buy a car, I like ra uh, Range Rovers. And I buy a car and I feel really good about myself as I'm driving that car. But after a few months, it the glory fades and I don't feel good anymore. So I go out and buy another car. This poor man was buying a new car. Every few months, he had money. He, had, he would buy every six months or whatever it was, he would buy a new car because it made him feel good about himself. If we're trying to get our self-esteem from outside, we're going to fail. A car doesn't last. 
with our self-esteem. Trying to get our self-esteem from other people doesn't last. You know, so, so many marriages have failed over the years because people think that their spouse is there to make them happy. No, you should already be happy. And if they say nice things to you, that's great. But you've got to realize that you're already complete. You don't need anyone else to complete you. You don't need a car to complete you. You don't need anything to complete you. You are complete. I am complete. And that is so important. And you'll realize, as I said, no one can ever sell you anything ever again. And the reason they can't sell you anything ever again is because of this. If someone wants to sell you something, just say they want to sell you that uh, Range Rover, how will they do it? They might go on TV and they'll make this advert. And this advert goes like those old cigarette adverts, which were lifestyle adverts. So they have this Range Rover on, on, um, on, the, on the beach, it's a four by four, remember? It's driving on the beach and you have all these sexy people on the beach and uh, there's a, a people lying back, drinking whatever drinks they're drinking and the lifestyle shows. As they're drinking those drinks, you feel good and you feel, I can, I can relate to that lifestyle. I wish I could have it. I'd feel so happy having it. That's what they think you'll think. But you can just say, no, I don't need that car because I'm already complete. I can have the car because I like it, but I'm going to have it because it's a nice car, not because it has to complete me. So you are already complete. You don't need any completing from anybody, anywhere, at any time. Now, what will you do? Do you remember these words? Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I have come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is oft inferred, interned with their bones. Now, what Shakespeare is telling us in this in, in, in the speech by Mark, uh, Mark Antony is this. He's saying, people who do evil, that lasts longer. People remember evil but they forget about the good. So we need to do 16 times more good than evil to be remembered. And, and our deeds will be remembered because we, we change lives. What we change as we change lives, so our good deeds will live on after us. Our good deeds will live on. So if you're supporting a charity and uh, uh, changing people's lives, might find there's a charity that needs help, you can help them, do something good like that, do enough of that, and that will live on. Not by people knowing you did it, that's not important, but it lives on as your good works. Because that um, uh, uh, old age home or whatever you support uh, will be able to continue and help people. And that's how your good works will carry on. Your good works are there because you want to help others, not because you need self-esteem from getting doing good works. So many people do good works because they want to feel better about themselves. But when you realize you're complete, you can do good works without needing any cheering onwards. You just do them because they're good things to do, because they help others, because they change the world. So you can be a world changer, not needing any glory. You look at people who, who, who do things, they might act as servants, but that's the greatest of all. The servants are the greatest of all, not the people who go around bragging and showing off. Showing off, as I said, is a sign of low self-esteem. Arrogance is only one of two possibilities. Number one, low self-esteem or else a psychological issue. So you believe that you're better than others. But actually, you're not. You're the same as others. You're just the same as others, just like everybody else. Now, imagine. 
flying in an aircraft. You're flying in an aircraft and both pilots die of heart attacks. What will you do? Do you know, for the first time in the history of flying, they have a course now, a training course, where they train pilots to react if their co-pilot dies in the seat next to them of a heart attack. That's a new course that's been brought out. There's something going on because a lot of pilots are dropping dead in their pilot seats. Something is happening. Now, imagine you're flying in this aircraft and both pilots drop dead. What will you do? You have a choice. You can go and sit and shake in the back of the aircraft or you can shout and complain to all the other passengers and say, we're about to crash, we're about to crash, we're doomed, lads and lasses. You can do something like that. Or you can run to the front of the aircraft and you can move the pilot, uh, one of the pilots out of the way, and you can radio, grab the, the mic and radio through to the state, uh, to the to ground control and say, guys, these pilots have just dropped dead. Explain to me what to do. You can take control. You see, most people are victims today. Now, most people being victims is a problem because they never do anything. When there's a problem, an issue, what do they do? They might go and toy, toy, complain. Isn't that what so many people these days do? They complain. And they are now just complaining. So you have a choice. You can be a complainer and or you can be a creator. You can create your own life. A complainer, a person who, who, um, who, who is a victim, never does anything. All they'll do is complain, whereas a creator creates their own life. Now, friends, it's time to create your own life, a life that's you, a life that you create. You can create anything you want in this world, anything you want, and it's yours. So you can create a, a, a wonderful charity, or you can create a business, or you can create... Uh, whatever you want, but you are a creator. Or you can sit back and wait for that aircraft to crash, complaining and muttering and moaning and say, well, I might as well die now because there's no point in my life. Yes, there is. There's always a point. There's always something for you to do. There's always something for you to do. A kind word, just a glass of water, a hug a smile, any of these things, that's something to do, which is great. You are responsible for everything that happens in your life. 100% of what happens in your life, you're responsible for that, 100%. But you say to me, how can I be responsible for something I didn't create? So imagine this. 80% or 90% of the time, we create our own problems. If we buy a car, a second-hand car, and we spend 5,000 Rand on that car, we're going to be buying a wreck. And if that car breaks down, is it the salesman's fault that it broke down, or is it our fault? I suspect it's our fault because we walked into something. Or we buy food and we don't look at the label and we see that it's full of additives or whatever it is and we eat that and we get sick. Whose fault is that? It's not the food company. It's your fault and my fault for buying stuff without checking the labels first. We are responsible. But now, what about that 10 or 15% that somebody else causes? So now... You're walking down the road, somebody grabs your handbag if you're a lady or your wallet if you're a guy, and they run off with it. And you chase them, but you can't get it back. How can you be responsible for that? Well, you are. You're actually responsible in this way. You're responsible in the way that 
you react in a certain way. So you could react and say, oh, no, oh, no, I've lost my money and much of mine. Or you can say, okay, here's a lesson. I've learned, I'm going to learn a lesson from this. I'm not going to walk down the road with a handbag anymore. Or I'm going to do this and this and this. I'm going to change my life in such a way that I'll reduce the risk of that happening. So you're responsible. Or you can just sit down and moan and mutter and go around complaining. Oh, this world is so terrible. South Africa is a horrible place. Or whatever you might say. But actually, we control what we think. We control our thoughts. And we have to have positive thoughts. Even in jail. Someone was say, uh, danced in jail and said, I'm dancing with joy because even though he was wrongfully arrested, he danced with joy in jail because he knew from inside he was 